This is Plate Mark. My name is Anne Schaefer, and I am your host. You have found us at Series 3 of Plate Mark, in which we're interviewing the amazing and wonderful people who occupy the print ecosystem. Today's guest is an incredible person, really. His name is Ad Steinman. He lives in Amsterdam, and believe it or not, we were able to record <laughs> across the ocean. It was amazing. Ad is primarily known as an historian and authority on etching and engraving intaglio processes from a materials point of view and techniques. His book in 2012 is seminal for anybody in the business, Engraving and Etching 1400 to 2000, a history of the development of manual intaglio printmaking processes. It is jam-packed full of stuff. It's, It's really something. And also he has written about color printing in the same manner in the same time period. So he's kind of the go-to guy. Clearly the man has a lot of knowledge in that head. Housekeeping. I identify as a cishet white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images that Ad and I talk about will be over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. You can also hit the support and donate button and help me keep the lights on. I'd appreciate it. I think that's it. Buckle up, and here we go. Ad, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming in live from the Netherlands. I can't believe I actually got you on the web. It's amazing. Welcome to the show. It, it, it took a while. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> it always takes a while. Yeah. The first order of business is for you to introduce yourself for our audience. So um, I'm both a professional printmaker and an independent scholar of the history of printmaking techniques, manual printmaking techniques, with a focus on intello printmaking, so that's engraving and etching, everything that goes with it, so presses, paper, ink, acids, tools, whatever. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> or you're a scientist and historian and a curator and a artist yourself? Yeah, correct. So I haven't been able to find any of your work online. We have to we, we have to dig some up to show everybody. You have found my scholarly website? Yes, I have found your scholarly okay. website. Absolutely. Right. Well, yes. Okay. I did a scholarly website in when was that? Early 2018 when I was not so busy. So I thought I would use my time properly. And it took me two months to set everything up. And then I got my work and got busy. So in between, I update information and, well, things like that. You know how it works. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. As somebody who had to teach themselves how to make a podcast and make the website, I can completely yes. <laughs> understand it why you're not work. on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. 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 Okay, well, so tell us about how you came to love prints and printmaking. When in your life did you discover prints and how did it all happen? <laughs> when I was a kid. So there is this story. I was about eight years old and uh, I took a piece. How do, how do you call that? Uh, pressed fiber covered with plastic on both sides. It's used for desks. Um, oh, yeah, sure. I don't know. Well, gosh, I don't even know what that's called, but I know well, what you're saying. Anyway, pressed fiber with a plastic coating. So I had a small block about six times eight inches. And I cut the outlines of a little goat uh, into the plastic. And then I uh, rubbed poster paint into the grooves, cleaned the surface placed a sheet of thin paper on top of it and pressed my thumb against the paper and I had the idea, now I should see something. And I was very disappointed. I didn't see anything. <laughs> but I say, as a kid of eight years old, I invented the principle of teleprinting. So that was the start. I didn't know what a print was, of course. That came a bit later. So when I was 14, I visited a cousin of mine and he was an artist and teacher for art techniques at a secondary school. And we went to his studio and I saw a machine. And I thought, what is it? So I asked him and he said, that's an etching press. And next time you'll come, I'll tell you how it works. And he explained to me, well, you have to get yourself some copper plates and a needle or a sharpened nail. And then you scratch the design into the copper plates. And next time you come, 
I'll show you how to print this. So half a year later, I was there again with my polished copper plates with the designs scratched into them. And he said, oh, okay, I'll show you. So he dampened paper. He took a plate of mine, rubbed some ink onto the plate, cleaned the surface, put the plate onto the bed of the press, put the damp paper on top of it, the felt over it, run it through the press. And by low, we had an impression. And I said, okay. And then he said, okay, this is how it works. And now I'll leave you. You can do the rest by yourself. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I learned the hard way at doing everything in myself and step by step. And that day I had some results, so not too bad. And then I asked him, so what's an etching? So Because I had already heard about it. I didn't know what it was. So what's an etching? He said, well, buy a book. Oh. <laughs> Quite a teacher. <laughs> Quite a teacher. He was a teacher. <laughs> yes. So but I, okay, so what to do? So I walked through a town nearby and I saw a bookshop. At least I, I thought it was a bookshop because I saw books behind the uh, window shop. I walked in and I asked what by the time I was about 15, maybe, maybe early 16 years old. And I asked the lady, do you have a book on etching? And she said, yes, we do have. And she pulled out a book of 1963 by Julian Trevelyan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Etching mm -hmm. in English. And uh, so she said, this is, the, this is a book on Etching. I said, oh, yeah. And in English, but, I mean, 15, 16, my English was not so fluent at the time. And uh, do you have anything in Dutch? And she thought about it and then went upstairs and came back with a book dated 1796. But it wasn't Dutch and it did cost a lot of money and <laughs> I didn't have that money. So, okay, I'll, I'll go for the English one. And so with the help of a dictionary, I found out all the materials that I needed. I acquired the materials. I prepared my etching bath. So with nitric acid at the time, I had a zinc plate and I coated it with etching ground, draw my design into the etching ground and coated the backside. And then the book said, well, if you drop the plate, into the nitric acid as proof of etching, you should see bubbles. Okay, so I had my nitric acid bath ready and my plate. I put my plate into the etching bath and I watched it and then I saw bubbles raising from the plate. And I got shivers. Oh. <laughs> I, like, it, it works. And then, yeah, and a very long... Story starts, of course. So yeah, at one point I went to uh, the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague. And oh, by that time I had been making etchings and dry points for how long? Five years or so? Four years? Something like that. And I was way in advance of the rest of my class who just started etching. So we got etching techniques in the second year, from the second year onwards. And I was way in advance of them all through the years. We had five years of training. Oh, wow. At the time. Yeah, yeah. So we, start, we started with one general year. And then the second year was also general, but with um, a bit on printmaking. The third year was a first choice. I did drawing and printmaking, painting, and I did a side class on sculpting. And then I decided for the last two years, I do printmaking. So the last two years was focused on printmaking only. And by that time, I saw that, again, my technique was a lot better than my classmates. And I decided to write a paper on printing processes so how to print your plate and what may go wrong and how to say it how to do it better how to change that and that worked that developed into what you can call now a master thesis at the time it wasn't called like that but now you would say it was like that and that master thesis developed further to my first book which was published in 1985 and that book had all the elements of everything i published afterwards so it had a list of phenomena that may appear in printing, a description of how it may come, and usually there are several ways why a particular phenomenon may appear, and uh, what to do if you want to emphasize it or if you want to remedy it. So it's more than just a troubleshooting book. It can do anything. 
And it had an appendix with technical manuals, and it had an appendix with enlarged details of uh, printing plates, prints, prints, I should say, prints and printing plates, yes. It had an appendix on prints by famous uh, artists and all these F. Comeback and all my later works, my later publications, my presentations, workshops, whatever you can think of, research. So when you're pulling together a book in 1985, and you have to get images from collections all across the world, like everything's by mail. I mean, this is, this is what I love to remind all my listeners. I mean, this is all, this is work. (laughs) It's not easy. It wasn't easy at the time. No, no. The last 10 years saw a lot of images in the public domain, which makes my work a lot, a lot easier and cheaper, I should say. And the quality of the images you can download now is so much better than 20, 30, 40 years ago. So that, that actually brings me to a question about the public domain images. So the mm. the Dutch museums have kind of been at the forefront of making these in the public domain images available yeah. and, and help us spread the word to the rest of the world. But Do they want to keep track of, can you just like click the button or do they want to have information about where it's going? One step back. So when I did my dissertation, so I defended my dissertation in 2012. My manuscript was already in 2010 and I needed over 300 images. A lot were from public collections and it was quite expensive. I should say American collections usually gave photos for free but I had to sign contracts on how to use them. In case it was for print, there were no costs. In case it was for an online presentation, like for an ebook or something like that, costs may differ. And also like the British Library at the time, if you wanted to have a photograph, it was about, I think, 10 or 20 pounds. But if you want to have it for an ebook, it was 105 pounds for one image. Wow. So that's a lot of, but they were not the most expensive. The most expensive one I experienced was um, <laughs> a museum in Switzerland. And uh, they have this lovely early 16th century painting with an engraver uh, on it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting for the introduction of my dissertation. And I said, can I order a photograph? Yes, you can. So what's the cost? Well, 225 Swiss francs, which is about $250, plus two copies of my dissertation. And I said, thank you, no. <laughs> there's <laughs> no, a footnote yeah go check no, out this no. painting <laughs> no and the image is known and it, is, it, it was already reproduced in several other publications so i just gave a reference but because of that so i, I also needed a number of images from the uh, rijksmuseum in amsterdam and at the time you have to pay for them still and my supervisor he contacted the rijksmuseum because at the time he had some influence there And he managed to get all the photos for free. At the time, also in London, the British Museum, Anthony Griffith uh, had calculated that if they would give photographs of prints for free, then there would be less costs for admin. And in the end, the British Museum uh, would make a profit. So for a very short period, you got your images for free. And these were high resolution images. And the Rijksmuseum quickly followed. So I think already one or two years after I published my dissertation, you could download the images from the Rijksmuseum for free. And these are high resolution images. And it's just uh, one click to register your email address. And the second click, you download the image and that's it. Amazing. No further questions asked. Right. That's yeah. amazing. Yes, and, and, and others, other museums followed quickly, like the Metropolitan Museum, for example. Mm-hmm. They're quite easy and very good quality images. And the Library of Congress has, well, it differs. Sometimes they have very high quality images, but when the images are older, they may be uh, scans of black and white photocopies. So it's, sure, it's, it differs, yeah. When I was still at the Baltimore Museum of Art, mm-hmm. this question about online catalogs of the yeah. collection and the images that go with those objects was it was a problem because lots of the curators were afraid to put things not afraid were unwilling to put things online 
yeah. unless there was a photograph, but yeah. that would take so long because we were so far behind the, you know, we just were putting them out there. I was taking snaps with my phone and giving them to the database guy. I'm like, you know, let's, let's see if we can get all these boohos up or whoever, you know, it was nuts. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. 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 No, no, many, many collections were like that. Yeah. They still are like that. Um, exactly. But I also cooperated in a project in Germany. So this concerned the uh, Virtuelles Kofferstich cabinet, so the virtual print room. We started in 2007, and the idea was to describe 100,000 prints in, no, I should say 40,000 prints in four years. Oh, golly. About that, yeah. And we managed. So um, so two institutions, so the... Um, Herzog August Library in Wolfenbüttel and the Herzog Anton Ulrich Museum in Braunschweig. They're only 12 kilometers, so eight miles away from each other. They have a joint history. So the prints in both collections were once gathered by the Dukes of the Land. What was the year? 1766. Parts of the prints in the library were shipped to a newly established print room in Braunschweig. So they were moved 12 kilometers because print rooms at the time were extremely fashionable. So in the 17th century, you had the Cabinet des Estampes in Paris, which was part of the Royal Library. And in 1720, Dresden, as the very first institution, set up an independent print room. And Braunschweig was the second in Germany and, well, well in Europe, the third. Since then, collections in the library and the museum, the print room of the museum, have been exchanging a bit. The last exchange was in 1927, yeah, when the library sent 10,000 prints and 1,000 drawings to the uh, print room, and that was it. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so, so what we did with the online database is, how do you say that, catalogue. Uh, prints in both collections and you could mark which was where and you could also mark uh, the provenances and in a lot of cases you would see that a print in the museum came from the library and very very sometimes a print from the museum uh, was returned to the library how were those early records i'm sorry i'm going to geek out on cataloging everyone sorry yeah how were the records kept because in baltimore they were on index cards that had all been typed from an older set of cards that the collector of 20,000 prints had kept. But like playing catch up with 20,000 things that suddenly land at the museum is a lot different than building a museum's collection over time, okay. right? So in 1550, there was a start of the library in Wolfenbüttel. And the majority of the books were donated to the new university library set up in the early 17th century. And then it started uh, collecting again. And so by 1666, yes, they had the largest library in Europe. They also had a handwritten catalogue, not cards, but you should imagine six very, very fat volumes, <laughs> volumes of about six inches thick, folio size, of course. And every object in the library, almost every object in the library was described very shortly. And that included volumes with prints because prints came to the library in choirs. And if in choirs are not too large, they were bound as volumes like choirs of books, of letterpress books, mm -hmm. a series of smaller prints were pasted onto sheets or sheets of paper were pasted around smaller sheets to make larger sheets. And these were pasted together to choirs and the choirs were bound in volumes. So the library has uh, quite a number of volumes with prints. The course of centuries, especially in the 19th century, a number of these volumes were cut up again for the prints only because the British Museum in the 19th century developed a very new system that is you take a print and you paste it to a uh, piece of cardboard, you mount it, so you can hold the cardboard and study the print. That is the image of the print. And still a lot of collections have followed that system and kept it like that. 
and cutting up volumes of prints for the prints only and paste them onto mounts continued until about 1990. So that's, that's only 30 years ago. And only in the course of the 1990s, the idea was, well, maybe we shouldn't do it anymore. And that also was the period that more, say, the interest in material aspects of the print did grow. And that was exactly the period that I started doing my research. So what I did at the time was not new. It was done before by others. And uh, and the students go back to the 19th century, if you wish, to the 18th century when people started looking at watermarks. What I did do is I, I, I started, of course, with the uh, engraving and etching techniques, looking at details, how they were done, how they were carried out, how the printing was done. I looked at paper, I looked at ink, not only watermarks. So dating of paper, dating of prints, drawings is very often done using watermarks. The problem with watermarks is that there are collections of watermarks, especially for the 16th century, less so for later centuries. And all this research is done on uh, paper in archives and paper in archives in 99% of the cases concerns written texts, documents, archival material. And watermarks are developed to distinguish between kinds of paper. So paper quality, paper format, and there is a difference between writing paper and printing paper. So writing paper must always be sized because writing was done with a watery ink on the paper. And if you write it a watery ink on unsized paper, it works like tissue paper. So the ink goes all the way. So in your paper, the surface of your paper needs to be sized and sometimes double sized. Then you can write on it and then the ink stay put where you want it. For printing, you need to dampen your paper to soften it, to soften the sheet, to make it pliable. And a little sizing is not in your way, but if it's double sized, then it may take a couple of days before your paper is pliable enough. And there are complaints in the 18th and 19th century when French plate printers wanted to print on a very beautiful Dutch handmade paper. And they say, yeah, yeah, we want this good. And then they said, oh, but it takes a couple of days before the paper's damp enough. Yeah, because it's writing paper, it's not printing paper. On the other hand, if you look at German papers from the, what is it, 18th, 19th century, printing papers are never sized. Sizing is only done afterwards. So when a bookbinder receives a pile of quires and the commission to, to bind it into a book, into a volume, the first thing the bookbinder does is sizing the sheets. I didn't know that. In France, a law from 1714, which states that all papers, whatever, needs to be sized, except, of course, for filtered paper. Because, okay, one step back, you have uh, (laughs) roughly five kinds of paper. You have wrapping paper, writing paper, printing paper, and decorated papers. So the writing paper must be sized. The filter paper must never be sized. And then the rest is in between. And it depends per region, per country, per mill, what they do. So can you just, I know, back up another step, yeah. help listeners understand what the sizing is? It's it's kind of like a glue, sort of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's So it's animal uh, gelatin. It's boiled in water. And a bit of alum is, so alum is potassium aluminum sulfate is added, which will tan the gelatin. Otherwise, the gelatin is... Um, too water-soluble. Mm. It must be dissolved in water, of course. Then you have the warm bath with gelatin and a, a bit of alum. And a sheet of unsized paper is drawn through it once and then it's hung up to dry. And then you have a very thin coating of gelatin on both sides of the sheet. And if you want to have a double size, you do it twice. And double size means, as I said, the coating is strong enough to to resist writing and the ink will stay put where you write it. When you look at two examples of printed letter press or whatever, can you tell if the printing has happened after sizing and before sizing? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, um, <laughs> is that a bad question? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. Can Thank I you. see this? Can can one <laughs> see this? Well, maybe if you do technical examination, if you use a very strong uh, microscope, like a digital microscope, you may perhaps see some gelatin on top of the letterpress. Yeah, perhaps. I, I, never, I never thought of that. That's a good oh, question. Yes, <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> and so can you, I know you're not, a, well, you you seem to know everything. When it comes into the 19th century and all those pieces of paper crumble in your hands when you're trying mm. to catalog them, what the yeah. heck happened? Uh, ha. Two things. First, they changed from linen fiber, so flex fibers, in the course of the 19th century because the need for paper rose dramatically. Mm. And so they started making paper from other fiber materials, mainly wood fiber. And wood fiber is a lot shorter. As such, not a problem. But then also the system of sizing changed. So before it was a coating on both sides of the sheet with gelatin and a tiny bit of alum. That's fine. And what happened in the course of the 19th century, a lot of changes, and um, they even might bleach the paper using chlorine. So these are not good things for <laughs> another material. Right. So if you have pure cellulose, pure cellulose is wonderful stuff. It holds well. But if you start adding chemicals, it falls apart. So that's what's happening. That's what's happening between 1818 and 1920 is that they had the worst possible combination of chemicals with paper fibers uh, that were rather short. The consequence was that papers browned quickly, that they did fall apart. On the other hand, already in, what was it, 1830, so that was maybe 50, 60 years after the uh, discovery of chlorine and the idea that, oh, you can bleach paper with chlorine. Yes, yes, you can do that. But then you also break down the fibers. So you get very short fibers and then the paper starts falling apart. Okay. So about 1830, there were complaints. We shouldn't bleach paper with, with chlorine. It's not good for the paper. Okay, okay, okay. So for the better quality of paper, they didn't do it. And the one solution was, if you want to have really white paper, you don't use linen fiber, you use cotton fiber. Cotton fiber is lighter. Using cotton fiber for paper goes back to the Arabs. So say 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century. And they use cotton fiber. Or perhaps it, it is said, and in some cases, yes. It had to do with the availability of the fiber material. And there are examples of West European paper made with cotton fiber from the 17th century, which was quite expensive. So if you have cotton fiber, uh, you have those how do you say it, those balls of cotton that come from the plant. Uh, there are seeds inside of the fibers, and you have to take out the seeds, and you have to do it manually. And that's a lot, a lot of work, and that raises the price of the, of the cotton fiber. So cotton fiber was expensive, a lot more expensive than the linen fiber. So cotton fiber was used for paper making, but only for the most expensive kind of writing paper. So that's for royalty. I once saw a sheet of paper. That, that was a letter of Christiana Sweden in the 1650s. <laughs> and the, the, the paper was white, white, white. Oh, wow. And it had, um, so the edges of the paper, so very thin edges, had gilding. So what happened is uh, that she probably had a pile of this white paper and the edge of the pile were gilded, like the gilding of the edges of a book. And she just pulled one sheet after the other from the pile. And that's very royal to have very white paper with a gilded edge. Right. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Th that must have been something. Well, she you... had some stature. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're focusing on Western papers and Italian Not techniques, but do you... Have you been to Japan to see any paper making there? Yeah, I've been in Japan a number of times. I saw that paper making. I tried to paper make myself there and then I decided, nope, not my thing. Oh. <laughs> Keep a distance. <laughs> they okay. can do it better. <laughs> yeah. So one of my projects was I curated an exhibition on Rembrandt and his prints and drawings on Oriental paper, mainly Japanese, but they said there was some Chinese paper. I haven't seen any Chinese paper. I saw 
base qualities of Japanese paper. And then you come into the history of uh, the presence of Oriental paper in Europe. And was there any trade? No, there wasn't any trade in the 17th century. There were occasional sheets, choirs, books of Oriental paper arriving in Europe. Earliest reference I came across was from an apothecary, so pharmacist, in, I think, 1630. He collected, as many did, exotic materials. So materials from outside of uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, Americas. And one object in his collection was oriental paper. And Leiden, of course, was the place where Rembrandt was born and lived and studied for the first, say, 25 years of his life. And he may have seen uh, the window shop of this pharmacist because this pharmacist displayed it in his window shop. And Rembrandt started printing on Japanese paper in about 1648. Where did he got his paper? We don't know, but we do know that occasionally sailors, so that's captains of, of, of sailing ships of the Dutch East India Company, brought remainders of Oriental paper with them and just sold anything exotic to people in Amsterdam because everything exotic was interesting. And yeah, you make the extra penny. And already oh, some years, some decades before, the Dutch East India Company decided, well, we need a paper for our administration. And so the ships got supplies of European paper with them, but usually it was not enough. And then they started looking for paper suitable for their kind of writing with quill and water-based ink on paper. And as I just explained, your paper needs to be sized properly coated on both sides, and then you can write with a quill and, and, and water-based ink on it. And most Asian paper is rather open in texture, in texture and structure, I should say, not sized. Asian paper is not sized. So if you write on that with a quill, then it's like writing on tissue. It, it, it doesn't work. However, they kept looking for suited paper, and they found a acquainted with Japanese papers. Oh, okay. I mean, very shallow okay, knowledge. Okay, okay. <laughs> Most of the papers already at the time were made from the inner bark of trees or shrubs. And there's uh, just an off-white colored fiber, very strong, long fibers, last long, especially the last long because there are no chemicals involved. Just short boiling in a lye in the process to break down the fibers, but then the rest is, is washed long in water, so there's no chemicals anymore. And you create paper with long fibers in an off-white color, and it's really strong. But it's open. For brush drawing, for brush painting, that's fine. For quill and ink, it's difficult. However, the Japanese have a process in which several layers of paper, what's the word, couched mm -hmm. onto each other and pressed and smoothened. And then you get a very compact paper. Uh, and that is well suited for writing with quill and water-based ink the way the Europeans did it. So if you look at the administration of the Dutch East India Company of the, uh, say, 1610s to the 1650s or so, what you see is a very durable, tough, smooth, strong paper of the kind that will last for centuries. It's a better quality than the European paper. And uh, the writing is done with the common iron gall ink used by all writers, European writers, in the past thousand years. And it holds well. Rembrandt got a pile of that kind of paper in different qualities. So the thinner kinds and thicker kinds, heavier kinds and, and lighter kinds of paper. And he found out that it's well for draw drawing, it's well for printing. And he uses it for his best quality impressions, which bridges the gap to why I study materials, that is to <laughs> materials and techniques, to bridge the gap with art history and bibliography and uh, explaining why particular aesthetics relate to the choice of materials and techniques. Oh, sure. 
Before no. you go there, though, is it possible that Rembrandt would have had relationships with the ship's officers and said, keep your eyes out for some paper for me? You would think so. I mean, he was well connected uh, with, uh, say, the higher layers of society. And he gathered a large collection of exotic materials. So if you go to the Rembrandt House Museum at the present in Amsterdam, which is in the house where he formerly lived for a long while, they have a room with exotic materials, of which we have a pretty good idea that he had collected them because he drew them, he painted them, or there was reference to it. And it's, say, javelins from South America. It's Indian drawings because he copied the, these mogul drawings. And yeah, so why not Japanese paper if, if there's an offer? You may presume that anything exotic was interesting for, for those collectors in Amsterdam at the time and beyond. Right. And um, also when you look at, how do you call them? Auction catalogues, especially of the second half of the 17th century, early 18th century, especially of, of libraries. So you have, say, a library of uh, 8,000 books Oh, yeah, okay, you go through the titles, so folios first, and then the quartos, and then the octavos, and then so on, smaller and smaller. And then the last two, three, four pages are the most interesting for me <laughs> because they have the rest of the library. So they have the bookcases, they have the shells, they have the javelins, they have uh, the armor, they have the uh, stuffed birds, they have anything you love to read about. It's there. Yeah, so people had an interest in books, yes, of course, but there was plenty of stuff more available. Wow. Oh, that's cool. The National Gallery, when I worked there, well, they still yeah. have it, obviously. They have an impression of the three crosses on vellum. Yeah. Which seems to just hold the ink in the most spectacular way. Mm -hmm. But how was he getting a hold of sheets of vellum like that? Vellum was, was commonly available. No problem. No problem. No. And how how do they do they have to treat it specially like they did the paper? Yeah, it's uh <laughs> testing. Okay, so, so technically, <laughs> so technically, so if you dampen paper just before printing, printing letterpress, printing etchings, engravings, so you run sheets through a bath with water, boil off the the excess of water, and you pile the sheets one on top of the other, <clears throat> and let it stand for a night or two nights. After that, the paper has absorbed enough water to be pliable on the one hand and to be damp but not wet on the surface. Because if the paper is too wet, then the oil-based ink and the water repel each other and you get a poor impression. So it's, it's looking for the balance. But that's easy enough. You don't run a sheet of parchment through a bath of water because then the sheet will be totally damp and it's unprintable. So it takes just a little bit of water. So if you have your pile of dampened paper, a so-called wet pack, uh, after two days, the water has spread homogeneously through the pile. And then you take one sheet of dry parchment and you place it between two sheets of damp paper and then a few sheets further on, another sheet of parchment, and another one, and another one, and so on. And after between 30 minutes and an hour, depending how damp your paper is, the parchment is suited for printing. And it, it means that the parchment is both pliable, because if it's dry, it's hard, and the surface is... So the fibers, say, of the surface are standing out a little bit. So it picks up ah. a little bit more ink than uh, when dry. So that is the pliability. It's a surface of the parchment. And what you have, the extra, the bonus, is that you can choose if you print on the skin side or the, no, I should say the hair side or the flesh side of the parchment. And the hair side is a bit shiny. So if you print on the shiny side, you get a bit of shine. It's the same as, as printing on, on silk. Impression on silk look lovely because of their shine. Right. Okay. Gosh. <laughs> My God, the knowledge in your head. Holy cow. So, <laughs> Training. So, yeah, right. I know. It's all accumulated knowledge, right? Yeah. So you focused on intaglio. Yeah. Do you 
dislike relief and lithography or are they no, just no 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 no, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no I, I did all manual techniques i did a few photomechanical techniques but photomechanical techniques i mean they're very legitimate that, that, there's no problem with that but if you're working in the arts so uh, in art practice you find out that you have a, a particular attraction to particular materials particular techniques, perhaps particular colors, particular surfaces, particular formats, like you have miniature painters, you have people who like to work on really large wall paintings. It's a difference in psychology, say, you know, mental state. Yeah, it, it, that differs, of course. Uh, you see people change in the course of their lives. And in my case, I did everything. And I soon find out that um, I preferred intelligent printing for reason that the rest is rather flat. So if you have an impression of a lithograph or a screen print, it's flat, flat. A woodcut can show some relief, and I like woodcuts. But look, if you have, if you print a black edged line, so a really thick, fat line, then the shade of this black line is darker than the black of the ink. So what more can you get? Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm with you. No, I'm totally with you. You know, and as a as a curator who was tasked with being, you know, loving all of the babies the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I also am in the Italio zone. My specialty is hater and Italio oh, yeah. seventeen. And yeah. so I totally am with you on personal taste coming into it, which is unfortunate when you're a curator because you're not supposed to have favorites. Of course you must have favorites. <laughs> <laughs> When they ask you, when they ask you, curate an exhibition of your favorites, you say, yes, no, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> because you, in the back of your head, you have your list of favorites. Sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So you you and Elizabeth Savage have also done a lot of work in color intaglio right. printing. Yeah, and yeah Elizabeth did, did the relief printing I did in Talio. Oh, she did the relief. Okay. Yeah. And so we teamed up for a conference and the book and it worked out. So nice. In your own print making do you employ now we need your website back up adam sorry <laughs> you're gonna have to <laughs> hop on it yeah are you do you use color i do use color yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. occasionally but it depends i mean depends on the subject depends on my mood so last year uh, a japanese paper making print making friend gave me a pile of uh, papers and so yeah just try them out and these were blank papers, uh, pinkish papers, grayish papers. So I thought, okay, let's react on the colors of the paper. So I took all the plates and prepared a number of color inks and printed with the color inks on to the sheet. And I combined it with uh, Chincolet. You know Chincolet? Sure, of course. Okay, so for, for the listeners, Chincolet is if you have a very thin sheet of paper, usually Japanese, but not necessarily. You paste the back of the paper, uh, you place the paper on top of your printing plate just before printing, and you cover it with a thicker sheet of European paper, and you run both through the press in one run. And then your thinner paper sticks onto the thicker paper, and your plate prints on both at the same time. Now, usually this is done for blank papers or using uh, an off-white Japanese paper, very thin paper, supported by heavier, whiter European paper. But you can also use, of course, colored papers. So in my case, I used um, these handmade color papers made by this friend of mine, and I selected some blue papers, some yellow papers, some uh, pinkish papers, all Japanese. I cut thin strips of these Japanese papers, applied the machine collet, so I pasted the, the, the thin strips on the back, placed them on the plate. And after printing, I also applied gold leaf uh -huh. onto the paper. So strips of gold leaf. So and that was on top. So the Chincolet is beneath the ink and the gold leaf was on top of the ink. And you can choose either to apply some paste to the paper and then apply your gold leaf. Or what's fun is that you can apply your gold leaf to the uh, uh, fresh ink when it's still sticky. Ah. Um, just touch it just a little bit to make it mm -hmm. stick and let it dry. And after the ink is dried, you brush off the excess of gold and then you have gold lines. Oh, fun. Yeah, that's fun. 
<laughs> you should try it. I know. I feel like I should. So yeah. for the the Chine Collet, some artists use it to have an have a slightly different color or tone yeah. to offset the print. But some artists like the way that the ink sits on the tissue more, and they get a, a different kind of quality of inking and printing in sure. the end, right? Yeah. Because sometimes yeah, you can't really even see that there's a sheen collet there, and you're like, Whoa. Um, I mean, you well, can find it eventually, but sometimes yeah. it's tricky. Well, it, it, it depends, of course, on the hue of the Japanese paper. If it is transparent and, and really white and your European paper is white, then you hardly see anything. You may see the rim of the paper, the edges of the paper, and that's about it. Uh, but if you use a an off-white paper or slightly yellowish paper, so an ivory toned toned uh, paper, and print it in black, then you will notice that the aesthetic effect is that uh, the image looks more spatial. So if your paper is really white white, then the contrast is strong, and reflection is high, and it looks flat. If your paper is off white and combines with black, then it it gives a slightly more spatial effect. Huh. I'm gonna need to see an example of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> huh. I never heard that before. That's interesting. You should try it. I. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're assuming I'm an that. artist. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I, I mean, if if you do mezzotints, uh, mezzotints are the earliest ones. Are always printed on white paper. But then in the early 19th century, they started printing in Chincolet because the Chine picks up a bit more ink. And especially if the mezzotins are rather sensitively made, so a lot of use, then then a slightly more ink is picked up. So the effect is stronger. And if you also use an off-white paper for the Yushin, then it looks more voluminous, more spatial, as I said. Huh. Interesting. We've all learned something new today, people. <laughs> That's what your podcast is for. Come on. That's right. You people are going to learn something. Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're you incredibly busy and you were in Washington, D.C. I see that I missed you. You were just here oh, as right. we're recording this. Yeah. So you travel around and do a lot of workshops at the invitation of institutions or how, do, how does that all work? Oh, well, not a lot of workshop, but but uh, now and again. It depends. Yeah. Um I get contacted. So it helps if you have a website. It helps if you have published something. And uh, for the rest, it's mouth to mouth, of course. People have heard about me or they have an interest. And yes, there are a few more people who give workshops on recognizing printmaking techniques. In my workshops, I focus on observation, training observation. So very practically. So people sit around and they have a print or a book with an, a book illustration in front of them. And my first question is, what do you see? And you can reply a lot, but I first let them struggle for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. No, just, it's, it's, it's uh, so just look at it. Uh, you have to learn to understand what you see. It's like a baby, a baby in the first three months of its life does not know what it sees. The eyes are open, light comes in, and the brain does something, but it takes a while to understand what it is. And the same with adults looking at an image. When I ask them, what do you see? A, uh, I see a print. Nice. And it shows a camel and two doves. Great. But this is a workshop on printmaking techniques and materials. Oh, okay, okay. Next question, what do you see? Uh, and then after a while, the idea is, oh, I see a sheet of paper, right? And there's ink on top of the paper. Great. That's what I want to hear. Good. <laughs> and next step, do you see black lines or do, do you see white lines? And then the discussion starts. And then it becomes more complicated when we are looking at techniques like aqua tint or mezzo tint. Oh, when you're looking at photomechanical techniques, how to define uh, colors, what names to use for colors. Uh -huh. Like uh, in, in English, you have those n names like fawn or taupe or <laughs> whatever. And no, <laughs> these are very fashionable names and fashion changes. So do you know what the hue of pink was in the 18th century? Describe the hue of pink. In the, in the 18th, 18th century? century. Um, 
I don't, honestly. Well, so if I say pink to you now, what you do you see? I see uh, something um, between bubblegum and ballet shoes. <laughs> yeah, what you is that? <laughs> pink. <laughs> Is it bluish, reddish, yellowish, brownish, um, greenish, purplish? It's a light pink that is r mostly reddish with a little probably blue, not yellow. Okay, good. You 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 are describing good. So that's next step. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm a trained professional, Ed. No, I mean, we, we, no, look, this is very serious. If yes. you give people a sheet of paper and it has a particular you and you ask them, describe the you. Uh, yeah, okay. So you have to build up a vocabulary, you have to uh, define the meaning of particular terms, and after a while you understand, okay, now we are on the same level, we describe, we see the same thing. If you go to Japan and you point to a, a green surface and they ask, what's the color? And they will say blue. Of course, they, they see the same as you see, but the word, and they have a word for green, it's midori. But they would say, oh, so it's blue. Because in their culture, th that's a name given to a particular kind of green. Huh. Okay, so back to our word pink, the word pink in the 18th century. You described a modern reddish, slightly purplish perhaps, you. Well, pink in the 18th century was a name given to a yellow-brown. What? Yes. So th th you have to be very careful with giving names to colors. So names like red, yellow, blue, green, purple, brown, gray are sort of universal. Well, I already explained with the Japanese example that blue may not be sky-like blue. And also, if you look at the traffic lights in Japan, they have a different kind of green than the American or European green lights would be. So it's all a matter of culture. So in describing colors, I teach people to be very basic with that. Is it a red? Okay, so red is this particular kind of the spectrum. And if it's not quite red, but is more to the yellowish kind, then you would say, well, it's a reddish orange, for example. Uh, or it's it's a, a green blue a blue green depending on what kind of the spectrum you are same with brown what is brown brown can be anything brown is a mix up of all kinds of paints and maybe on a greenish side on a grayish side on the uh, reddish or yellowish side you don't know so be particular <laughs> but general it's a tough when I was learning how to catalog as a young curator type at the National Gallery, we were very, uh, I was taught that you should use not tan or off-white or cream or any of those or beige, Correct. God help yeah. you, yeah. but it should be light brown. For or, right. So that the cataloging across the board never said what you won't see taupe or lavender somewhere you'll see no. light purple or so, no, so to no. try and keep it narrow and clear yeah. yeah okay and that is in between a a particular say social cultural group uh, which have sure. sort of the same background but if you use the word taupe or fawn as an american with a, an audience which is from say germany or uh, south africa well maybe it's not south africa uh, so say madagascar or, or uh, afghanistan say they would have no idea what you're talking about right right i also want to swing back around to you hmm. helping people learn how to look closely and how that advocates for print rooms and spaces where one can encounter yeah works of art closely without glass in between and guards yelling at you, um, yeah. which is exactly what print rooms are for and why they're such special places. Hear ye, hear ye, everybody. <laughs> I'm always going on about how important I felt the print room yeah. was at the museum and that it was the second front door. It was a way that a lot of young people came to the museum for the first time and how that interaction was really important to yeah. creating lifelong museum goers. All oh, right. Okay. So if people walk through museums, they are supposed to keep a distance. 
There may be a court, there may be a line on the floor, there are guards standing next to important paintings. So keep a distance, you may look and that's it. As we in the Netherlands teach children, uh, you look with your hand on your back. Yes. Yeah, don't yes. touch. Touching is not allowed. And also you're not allowed to, to come too close to avoid any body fluids touching the object. And in rare cases, you have exhibitions that have objects that you are allowed to touch. You must touch. Okay. Okay. That's rare. So if you go to a print room, you can see drawings, you can see prints, photographs, sometimes other materials, and they are allowed to hold the objects in your hands. That is the mounted object. Sometimes materials are not mounted, but you can come close to the object, much closer than walking past them in, in the museum galleries. It's not only that you can come close, you can see the, the texture of the paper, you can see the reflection on the ink, you can see the shades uh, on raised relief. You can turn over the page or the sheet and see the back of the sheet. If you go to a library, you can come even closer because you must the leaves of a book. Uh, otherwise, you can't see the other side. Right. You must touch them. And yes, there are some collections and they say, well, uh, better use gloves. There's discussion on gloves, uh, cotton gloves, latex gloves, other kinds of gloves, maybe without gloves. In the Rijks Museum, they decided after a while, well, we have more damage done by people wearing gloves than people not using gloves. And so, yeah, no gloves in the Rijks Museum. But in other collections, you get uh, cotton gloves and cotton gloves are horrible because they are so smooth and uh, the, the paper slips through your fingers. And also, it's technically seen not so smart because there's always uh, some 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 fat in your skin and the cotton works as a wick in a candle. So within half an hour, the fat blooms out on the outside of your cotton gloves. So you have to replace them very rapidly. If I use gloves in print rooms, it's latex gloves. Latex gloves gives you a particular grip, but not too strong. And uh, you could use vinyl, but vinyl is too smooth and then it slips to your fingers again. So latex is, is slightly better. Yeah, the print rooms that I've worked in have all been wash your hands first places, like you didn't example, wear yeah. gloves. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. you know, unless it was uh, at the National Gallery, they have those gorgeous Huffnagel volumes that are all vellum sheets. There's four yeah. of them with watercolors and the corners of each yeah. page are, they feel like butter, you know. And so now I don't think anyone can handle them, to tell you the truth. But at the mm -hmm. time, like we were still using our hands and it was the mm -hmm. discoloration on each corner was starting to really be... Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I, yeah. So for a while, I, I taught students at a Dutch university and they had a special collection to train the students. Former staff trained the students to feel the difference between a relief print and an intelligent print by touching the plate mark. Not smart. Uh, because after generations of students... These plate marks were soiled with bodily grease, so all grayish, brownish. And then I thought, no, let's do it differently. So I prepared an etching with a strong relief, made a blind embossment, so without ink, and mounted it. And over the mount, I pasted some melanex, so very thin kind of plastic. Ah. This allowed the students to touch the plastic, feel the relief, and if necessary, the plastic could be cleaned with a damp sponge or so. Huh. Basically, I train people not to touch the image. So if you use a magnifying glass, magnifiers, say, magnifying 10 times, are very helpful in understanding what techniques were used in plate making or block cutting. And yes, you hold the magnifier, but you do not place it on the sheet. You don't want to damage the image. So if you hold a print by the edges of the mount, and if a print is unmounted, then you use the edges of the sheet. And if the sheet is cut at the plate mark, yeah, then you have a slight problem. And then it's, uh, yeah, what, what you can do. I mean, you carefully lift it with clean hands, of course, and, and, and support it with the back of your hand if necessary. Right. Or let the professionals do it. 
um, yeah, if they have time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're busy. I mean, you're not the only one. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I mean, obviously it's a, an opportunity for education right there mm. about how to handle yeah. the works of art. So it all works out. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's part of the training. I mean, yeah. when I give my courses, I start with how to hold a sheet of paper, how to leaf through a book, how to hold a magnifying glass, the very, very basics. And after one or two or three minutes and, and making one or two mistakes, people uh, get it. And uh, so uh, you mentioned I was in Washington, Library of Congress. They have a, a pretty large department for prints and photographs. Staff of that department, the staff of the conservation department attended my workshop. So I gave the first instructions, as I just explained. And then afterwards they came to me and they said, well, we need new magnifying glasses. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the magnifiers we had in our various print rooms weren't very good either. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes there are, in some cases you need a really... Um, really strong magnifying glass, magnification of 25 times or even larger. And there are manual magnifiers for that, but you have to place them on top of the image. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's a matter of care. Don't place it on a line, just place it next to it. Perhaps you can place a sheet of very thin melanex in between. Yeah, but sometimes it needs to be done. Yeah. But then you know, and then you are very careful and you do what you have to do. Right. Tell us what's coming up next for you. What are you working on? Oh, several projects. So starting with Washington, the second part of the week was spent on the conference from JIGG to Gutenberg. It was a comparison between a letterpress by Johann Gutenberg, the European inventor of metal type printing in the mid 15th century, and Korean metal type printing of two centuries before. Now for specialists, this is now uh, it's known that the Koreans printed with metal type two centuries before Gutenberg, but it's not common knowledge. Uh, of course, one of the questions is, did Gutenberg know or was inspired in one way or the other by the Korean metal type printing? Is there an opportunity? Was there anything known about what happened on the other side of the Eurasian continent? And of course, yeah, like paper making, like gunpowder, those inventions were made in the east of Asia and traveled all the way to Europe. Uh, but there are also European inventions like perspective drawing that moved eastward. So uh, from, say, three millennia ago, there was a constant dissemination of information and objects and people moving from east to west, or from est west to east, that is from the very west of, of Asia, Japan, China, Korea, Vietnam, to Africa, to the east coast of Africa. So there are Buddhist statues found in the center of Africa in, in say, pre-colonial times because of trade in the Indian Ocean. There are, of course, uh, plenty of objects moved to Europe in Roman times. The Romans bought Indian spices, and they spent so much money on them that at one point in the third century CE, they stopped buying spices because the Indians asked more and more money. Uh, the Romans lost their gold and their silver on it. So no, no, we're not <laughs> going to do that anymore. But of course, on the other hand, they wanted to have lovely silk to dress in. And yeah, the silk comes from India and perhaps further east. Yeah, things like that. And there are, of course, uh, political contacts going east, west, west, east, all the way through the centuries. So it's, it's, there's nothing new. Things happen. People are interested in each other. So do we know if Gutenberg knew about the Korean metal type? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> of course we don't. No, 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 no. No, the exchange was between um, scholars, so uh, Korean, Chinese scholars, uh, European and American scholars. From what do we know and at what point do we stand? And then you look at people moving from Asia to Europe in, say, 12th, 13th, 14th century, because that will be the period that is on research. Yeah, we can, you can say something about it, like uh, where were the first uh, woodblocks printed on paper? Because woodblocks printed on fabric or on leather, uh, that's already in 400 BC in India. And it moves east and it moves west. And at one point, it, it, you find uh, fabric 
uh, Chinese fabric printed with woodcuts in the second century BCE. And then it comes to Egypt where you find it in about 600 CE. And then from Egypt, it moves to Italy, from Italy to Germany and England in the 13th, 14th century. And that all happens long before Gutenberg starts printing with letterpress. So the, the relief printing was already there for a couple of centuries before he got the idea maybe we should use metal instead of wood for printing. Okay. Right. So, uh, other projects. Um, oh, the most recent project is, uh, you know, the, the Belgian artist James Anser. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is 1860 to 1949. So that means that next year he died 75 years ago. And in Belgium, that is reason for celebration. <laughs> and so there will be some activities, some exhibitions, and I'm involved in the organization of one exhibition. So I, I'm, I'm in the advisory board, especially for printmaking techniques, his printmaking materials and techniques. And I will write something for the catalog. And so I was a keen experimenter with etching techniques. And... Um, Sometimes he was just wrong. Things went quite bad. <laughs> but that's interesting. And he plays with materials. He, he prints on colored silks. He, he uses different inks. Well, he didn't print himself. He had his plates printed. And then at one point, he started making uh, lithographs. So all very interesting. The other thing that I wanted to mention to folks is your, uh, is it a glossary of the terms on the address? Yeah work that you did. I don't even know how you start compiling something like that, but super useful for people if you're a cataloger particularly, yeah. and you can't figure out what those abbreviations yeah. mean. Yeah. Well, I needed that for my dissertation. So if you've seen my dissertation, there are five appendices, and one of them is a list of terms and abbreviations in print addresses. So print addresses are the lines usually beneath the image of a print, sometimes in one of the corners or in the upper margin of a print. It tells something about who designed the image, who cut or etched or engraved the image, who published the image. It tells you something about copyright. Uh, sometimes it tells you who printed the image, information like that. And there are lists available. Uh, usually they are short and I started with, with compiling what lists I had in my book collection. Then I saw more and more and more and more. So I just gathered and gathered and gathered until I had to stop uh, compiling uh, the manuscript for my dissertation. So what you see in the volume I published in 2012 is what I gathered up to 2010. And then after a few years, I came across more expressions and terms that I didn't know, hadn't seen before. Also, people corresponding with me about this list and saying, well, I found this. And well, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. No, oh, I look into that. So it keeps adding and adding up. And um, at one point I thought, OK, there's so much interest. So um, I just published it on my website and it was a lot of interest. So, OK, I'll continue with that. And now it's like when I see something interesting, I add it to my list. And now and again, I uh, upload uh, a new version of the list like that. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, think like this. Nobody will pay you for that. Well, um, I was going to ask. <laughs> no, of course not. And uh, <laughs> But they are so useful. And uh, it's something I do in between. Sometimes there are months that I, I don't find a new uh, um, uh, expression. And, and sometimes I find uh, 10 in half an hour. Okay, I just put them on the list. It's useful. Yeah, you gather it over the course of years and it's just very useful material. And uh, it's up there and you just you just download it. Come on. Like I said, nobody will pay you for it. And it's so very useful. And I get so many comments and, and people give me new information. So that's very rewarding. Well, yeah, I mean, we can close by me telling everyone that obviously you have written very important books about it and tell you printmaking techniques, but on the um, Association of Print Scholars uh, mm. listserv, people write in questions about all sorts of things. And usually there's somebody who says, add, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and you're the one who comes in swooping in as the authority. And so yeah, I was like, yeah, we yeah. got to talk to him. 
<laughs> well, I, okay, so I go, I'll go back a little. Uh, so when I was preparing my dissertation, a lot of students and some more advanced colleagues who had questions about printmaking techniques. And uh, for me, these were interesting because, oh, they are interested in that subject. Oh, I should write about that too in my dissertation. <laughs> and uh, when the book was published, it was quiet for half a year. Uh, before publication, two questions per week, and then for half a year, it was quiet, dead quiet. People were reading the book. Nice. <laughs> and then the questions came back again, and, and now it's uh, between two and five per week. And I do answer all questions because, oh, so here's a personal story. When I was preparing my dissertation, uh, on some occasions, I had my own questions. So I contacted people in university departments or specialists. And most people were kind enough to answer my questions. But some people just did not, just stared at me. Or I, I sent several emails and they didn't reply. And then I called and they still didn't reply. And then I thought, no, that's not a good thing because I'm doing my dissertation. Uh, I have a very valid reason for asking questions. And if you if you can't answer it, it's fine. And you say, sorry, I don't know. And and sometimes people ask me uh, things and say, sorry, this is not my field. And, and perhaps uh, there's somebody else. And uh, maybe I have a name or a contact address or a website. So please check there. But it's always worthwhile. It's always rewarding uh, to reply, if possible, uh, in one way or the other. So when I had my assistants and they got questions, I told them, look, if, if somebody has a question, and you can reply, then say, okay, I will, I will reply within 48 hours or I will reply after the weekend. So yeah, that's fine. Don't let people wait. I once was assistant to a curator and well, she got questions, she got letters and just put them on the pile and waited half a year for replying them. It's a uh -huh. no, 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 we don't do that. No kidding. Uh, we, we reply within 48 hours. And if you can, you reply. If you cannot, then you are clear and say, sorry, this is not my field. Or try contacting this person, see that website, or here's literature. Of course, people ask questions and the answer is in the dissertation. So engraving and etching. I say, okay, you look at page so-and-so, check no <laughs> that, that. Check the literature. Yeah. Uh, because that's, um, oh, uh, so, okay. So about my dissertation, at one point, my supervisor and I discussed what will it be? because again, clear, it was not your common dissertation. Your common dissertation would be 180 pages, A5 size, and that's it. And no, no, this will be a little bit more. So what do we do? You write as compact and concise as possible, and you give the overview in text, and you tell the story again in images. So images and text go together. So the image illustrates the text and the text explains the image. And together they tell the complete story. And if you wish, you can just watch the images and still comprehend what the volume is about. So when you have the overview, then you check the footnote, you check the references and you check the references in detail. So you call up the, the articles and the books to better understand what it is about. Right. And then don't forget the errata I just published because the errata explained that, well, what we did know in 2012 has changed a bit <laughs> and research has been done and I made mistakes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. What I, I, we just met today. Yeah. Everybody. But what I love about Ed is that he is like me and all boats rise kind of person, which is I want to help you as much as possible and help, yeah. you know, everyone understand what this crazy world of prints is and uh, is about so thank you for coming on and sharing your story with us ad i i think uh i think it's just you do amazing work i'm really just so in awe of you <laughs> uh, well like i said it's rewarding but it's also necessary well ad thank you again for coming on plate mark it was a delight talking to you thank you for the invitation it was of fun course. yeah so, i'm glad Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Plate Mark with my guest, Ad Stainman. He's incredible, and I feel like we could have talked for another five hours or something. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I always need to send a thank you out to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music, and also one to Dan Fury of Extension Audio for helping me with the sound mixing. I'm just not an audio guy. I just can't do it. I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. We'll see you next time.